Hello ladies, I'm Lydia Ruth. Please click the link in the description box and go to the place I've posted this video where you can listen to it without ads. And welcome to Homemaking Radio. Hope you get a few things done while you listen today and welcome to the manse. I'm in the sewing room and I am also getting some things straightened out in the rest of the house and it always takes me longer to get here than I intend mainly because I never feel quite ready and I never feel quite like I'm doing my best and today I'm going to try to do better you know we can do better and one time years ago I was visiting someone and uh, it wasn't in the US and he said you know you Americans you do this and you do that and you say this and you say that and, and he was confused about how we joke or talk or describe things and after listening to it for a while I realized yes it would seem strange uh, to from his culture to ours and I just looked at him and didn't know what to say so I said you know we'll have to do better and I remembered it from the phrase came from Lady Harriet in Wives and Daughters. And uh, she told somebody who was critical, we'll, we'll have to do better. <laughs> and so today I want to start out by saying congratulations if you're dressed or congratulations if you're getting ready to get ready. If that's all you get done today, I want to congratulate you. Remember I told you the story of a woman that, that had had a really hard winter where she lived and she'd kind of fallen into a, a slump and she was more isolated than most people and she realized she was going to have to get herself out of it. So she gave herself a list of small things to do, just real small things, until she was able to get up, get fully dressed, get ready for the day and she, they were really small things to do that were Thing, thinking things and doing things and they were things like uh, say one sentence of a prayer one sentence uh, of your with your feelings in it you know something that you made up read one verse of the scripture or one uh, paragraph in a book that you like uh, read aloud a recipe and try a new recipe and if you're not up to that then uh, draw something, write something, go for a few steps walk even in your house. Just start to pull yourself up out of that slump that you may be in because maybe you've had some illness or maybe you've just had needed some more rest or maybe suffering from overcoming some disappointment and you have to list yourself a bunch of little things to get yourself up out of that. And I remembered from the olden days, ladies, those of you who are vital, we used to have these self-improvement lists where things we wanted to do uh, within the next year, learn or do. And one of the things I would like to do is improve my correspondence, improve my handwriting, improve, uh, take an art course and improve my art or um, just improve in general the atmosphere of my home. And so today I want to read something to you or at least uh, paraphrase it to you about the home and if you are getting dressed good for you I'll give you merits for that even if you do nothing else get dressed because it gives you a start it pulls you up out of your slumber and mentally and physically so what I would like to tell you is to finish each day and be done with it now we homemakers uh, we feel so responsible and we carry such a feeling of duty with us that we often look back on the day and feel terrible that we were so inadequate or we didn't finish everything that we wanted to do and that's why I suggest to go around your house and do whatever is the most essential and I've always said it is for me it's the uh, the areas where there is running water the laundry room the bathroom and the kitchen to get those things cleaned up because it would collect the most bacteria I think and I like to keep my fridge clean I don't always accomplish it as you will notice I never do a broadcast in those places <laughs> and because I do have um, family members that still come and visit and stay and taking one day at a time is so important and not to carry the next day's failures into the morning 
And we all know that there will be some blunders and um, some things that happen or maybe a tremendous waste of time for some reason. Maybe our brains aren't functioning as alertly as they should. And to remember that we need to forget them and start a new day. Now, we grew up that way uh, back in the 50s on the homesteads in Alaska. Many people had that attitude. You start over, you say your prayers at night, you get God's uh, forgiveness, you wake up uh, starting over. You wake up with a new day, and you don't carry the, ne the last day's uh, blunders with you. And we try not to impose all that on the children either, reminding them over and over and over <laughs> of their guilt and... Um, Getting them, uh, the thing is, when people do that, when they constantly remind you of how inadequate you were the, the day before, it, it keeps your mind from going into a hopeful state of accomplishment and uh, an optimistic idea of uh, maybe, maybe achieving something. And we want to keep our minds free of the things that hold us back. Uh, remember, the Apostle Paul said, forgetting what lies behind and the sin that weighs us down. I press forward to the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. And we know that the high calling is a beautiful thing. We can live our talents. We can, at home especially, we can do well if we want to. And we don't have to uh, approach it as drudgery. And one of the things that I always encourage you to do is dress up like you're not going to go into um, a grim job or drudgery, but dress up nice as though you're going to do something leisurely. Put an apron on over it, and you'll find, I believe, at least for me, uh, that it helps you to approach your work in a friendly way. And I like to listen to uh, audiobooks or something else, you know, on... Uh, on uh, the web and uh, and I have other uh, DVDs and CDs and recordings that I like to listen to seem to make the time go a little easier even the, the most difficult jobs at home so tomorrow is a new day begin it well and serenely and with too high a, a spirit to be uh, encumbered with your old nonsense <laughs> Um, in other words, with such great uh, positivity that nobody can knock you over. This day is all that is good and fair. It is too dear with its hopes and invitations to waste a moment on all the yesterdays that have not that have come before. So I just wanted to en encourage you to do that. I wish I could have paraphrased it a little better. Today, I will probably talk to you a little bit about homemaking, but you know, you can get most of your homemaking, most of your homemaking hints and ideas from other places. There are so many of them. I like Pinterest. I always find some interesting things. If you want to go look at my Pinterest, I'll stick a link there uh, in the uh, on the page where I'm embedding this, and you can go see what I have. And also, it's on the upper left-hand corner of uh, my post so be sure and go there I don't know how to contact you you know with my regular post but you can find me if you want to somewhere and uh, you can subscribe on the YouTube channel of course but always go to the blog because that's going to have photographs and it's going to have links and it's going to have things I have quoted there that you might want to see now last time I talk to you about the things and the routines that women used to do that seemed to shelter them from extreme stress. And they all had a extreme stress, death in the family, house burned down, um, children injured, uh, loss, great losses, but didn't seem to ruin them the way it ruins people today. And I'll have to tell you that I think that we had our routines, the routines that women of old used to have. We had them, um, I would say, covered up or denied us by 
the public school from a young age because what are they what are you doing you're getting ready for school but at home a woman would be washing her hands carefully getting her hair done getting ready uh, putting her apron on looking at her cookbook or finding uh, looking around to see what she could put together for a meal and uh, she may even go for a little walk outside her house and engage in some prayer and some Bible study. And those things were somewhat denied us because after you get through 12 years of education every day for nine months out of the year, uh, you're not in those habits. You don't have those routines. You don't develop them. And so if you come home to be a homemaker, you're going to have to develop these routines and these habits and make a list of things to do. Get yourself prepared. Um, do a few stretches, exercise. You know the Proverbs 31 woman, it indicates in the, those verses, which I never hear people talk too much about. Most people are busy trying to make her into a career woman so they can justify um, leaving the home and, and being a career woman. But it talks about how she uh, strengthens her arms. Well, yes, you would have to. She had a spindle and she had some wool and You'd have to hold this spindle up and turn it and pull this wool thread to make the yarn. And so to be prepared for it, she had to strengthen her arms first. Well, she would probably do some stretches. And this is probably something that might be useful to you in, even if you're not spinning, might be useful to you in homemaking and also developing your routine. So you could develop your routine by sitting and thinking for a minute what would be the most beneficial to you. Do you really enjoy getting out of the bed, your heat feet hit the floor and you run into the kitchen and you pull this out and pull that out and you, your, your thinking starts to become more and more jumbled, your breathing is shallow and you start to be unhappy and feeling oppressed. But these routines were so sweet and most of the, our mothers back in the 1950s could be seen Early in the mornings, they had already been up quite a while, gone for their little walk, maybe gone out to the garden to check that out, pick a few things, and come in, fix themselves a cup of coffee or tea. And um, sometimes early in the morning, uh, the children would notice she was sitting in her chair, drinking her coffee, and going through her uh, reading, her, uh, what was it called? It was called uh, uh, My Stack of Reading, or... Uh, it's a reading supply where they would collect all the things they needed to read that had either come in the mail or they had and they were by their chair and, um, and I've forgotten what they what they called it I don't think they called it a reading supply but it it was their their reading and um, they could be seen uh, in leisure a lot of leisure they had their crochet and their knitting and they had their reading and they had many other interests but they weren't at labor all the time like many of us seem to be and I really believe that it can buffer us and calm us to have these uh, what they call self-care now but I call it uh, maintenance <laughs> uh, care for themselves uh, getting themselves ready and if you've got yourself ready Congratulations, and uh, I wish I could give you a diploma for that. I think that's a great accomplishment. Sometimes it takes me till noon to really feel that I am ready. But uh, so these little things, and whether it be uh, feeding their uh, whatever animals they had or pets or whatever, these little routines were very important to them. And I remember... Um, some people from the previous generation in the 1940s, those women, were they would wear what was called a house dress right after they got up and do a, a few quick housekeeping things, maybe even um, get their breakfast ready. And then they would go into the bathroom, shower, bathe, and change into something nicer. And um, so, but I think that for me, I think that I don't feel like doing anything until I'm dressed. And I told you last time, I can't even sit and write a letter or um, or do, I just can't even hardly do anything. I can't even go to the front door <laughs> unless I'm dressed. And I think that comes with being becoming more vital where, uh, you know, we have to be 
we have to be more careful because we don't look good, as good as we did when we were teenagers in our pajamas and without combing our hair. Um, so, but I wanted to uh, tell you about this, one of these, I call them, if you want to call it self-care, you can, because many caregivers are required to spend a certain amount of time rejuvenating themselves and doing things. And um, I know they call them um, idea boards now. Back in the olden days, we had scrapbooks, and we would just put things in them that made us happy and inspired us and things we'd like to look at or maybe even like to do. I remember the writ dye ads in all the magazines. Remember those? I used to cut those out because they showed how you could take an old rug and an old bedspread and old curtains and dye them all the same color and redecorate your room if you had a room. And I, we used to uh, enjoy cutting those things out. And um, so those were like idea boards for us today. They were the old fashioned scrapbooks on brown paper. And this Anne of Green Gables treasury always inspired me. If you can get a copy of this, you can sometimes get these new. And uh, it talked about the pressed flower scrapbook. I'll try to get a picture of that for you on the page. And by the way, please go to that page where there's a link uh, below in the description box on the channel here. And go to that page and listen to this, okay? Because then you won't have to uh, deal with ads. So it says here, buy or make a booklet of blank pages. Well, today we can do that. And they say art paper, watercolor paper, any kind of paper that is for, um, that's not, doesn't have a lot of chemicals in it or is not for business, that it works better if you want to make a booklet of blank pages. And all you have to do is have a hole punch and um, thread some string or ribbon through it. Or if you want to staple it, you can get uh, colored staples. And there are just different ways to bind something like this. Um, and it says, arrange your pressed flowers. I told you before, they used to take a great big book and uh, put flowers in. We usually use the catalogs. They were really thick. And put the pressed flowers in those. Put the flowers you wanted to press. Then later on, when they seemed dry and flat, you'd take them out and you'd stick them onto a letter that you were going to write. And you might say something about what the name of it was. And so let me explain how they are explaining it here. First, it tells how to make uh, do the pressed flowers. And so you'll, you'll want to read that on how to create, uh, how to make the flowers pressing anyway. And they used to have a, I think it was a cardboard and wood press, three or four layers, and it had a bolt together and everything. It must be an easier way to do that. We, we always used books. It was easier for us. And uh, it says here, I feel it's called pressing flowers. It's, it's the is the chapter on pressing flowers. Let me see if I can find the front page of it for you. It's called Pressing Flowers. I feel as if I had opened a book and found roses of yesterday, sweet and beloved, between its leaves. Anne of the Island, that's by L, uh, Lucy Maud Montgomery. The sentimental age of the Victorians as people who lived during the reign of Queen Victoria were called, gave rise to many customs that reflected their interest in nostalgia and remembrance. Placing a rose or other flower between the pages of a book preserved the flower and thus the memory of that sweet occasion it represented. And when a young lady received a bouquet for a special party, she would press at least one of the flowers as a keepsake for the evening. Brides pressed flowers from their bridal bouquets. Even young men were not immune to sentiment in those days. Diana happened to notice, this is from Anne of Green Gables, Diana happened to notice a certain gentleman discreetly re retrieve a rose of Anne's uh, bouquet one evening. Pressing flowers need not be limited to souvenirs or bygone moments. They can be made into very attractive arrangements for pictures, greeting cards, bookmarks, place cards, and other decorative objects. Place the flowers carefully between the pages of a heavy book, such as an outdated telephone book, remember those, uh, or encyclopedia volume. 
fairly flat flowers such as violets, pansies, buttercups, and asters are the easiest to begin with. Place the flowers face down as close to the binding side of the page as possible. That way they'll have the most weight on them. With your fingertip, press down on the backs of the flowers at their centers. This will help spread the petal out in their natural position. Slowly roll the pages of the book down on top of the flowers to close the book and hold the flowers in place. Yes, that is very careful. You have to put the flower right there and then roll your page over it. You can't just close it because the flower will move and then it won't be pressed properly. Uh, if you have a number of, uh, with both hands, press down on the top of the closed book to firmly flatten the flowers inside. If you have a number of flowers, repeat this process in the same book, leaving a few pages between each group of flowers. We would uh, have a, quite a few pages, or you know, quite a thickness, maybe half an inch uh, between the pages. You don't want all those wet flowers, because they do have some moisture in them, um, to mingle with each other, and you need to uh, have quite a few pages. If you have a, a set another heavy book or brick on top of that book to weight it down further. Leave the flowers in place for a week or so. You may want, now this is kind of a lost art if you let it be, but you can go find uh, flower presses or you can maybe just go to uh, Goodwill and buy an old book that, that uh, doesn't mean anything to you. Or go to the Dollar Tree and just get one of their books and uh, to press flowers if if the book is wholesome. You never know who's going to open those pages and actually read this, some of the stuff. So just get, get something that's appropriate and you can use those. That's the easiest flower press there is. The other flower presses you can buy online. They're up to $35 to $40. They're quite expensive, but you can make your own. And uh, you can find out free instructions on how to make your own flower press. Leave the flowers in place for a week or so. Check on them after the first day to see if the petals need to be rearranged. Sometimes when you close the book, the petals kind of roll up. The pages will push the petals around. If so, use your fingertip or a toothpick to rearrange them. When you are ready to arrange the flowers, remove them from the book and spread them on uh -oh, a piece let me, I just thought, thought of something I have to write down. And spread them on a piece of white paper. Choose the flowers you want to use for your project and decide on the arrangements. Then with tiny dots of glue, white glue is ideal, on the backs of the petals, stems, and leaves, attach the flowers to the card or paper they will adorn. You can paint an extra touch, such as tendrils, leaves, and berries, and flower buds, if you like. You needn't limit your pressings to flowers. Leaves from clover, ivy, ferns, herbs, and evergreens press very well. Experiment with different flowers and leaves at different seasons. So you can make a pressed flower picture. I will try to put the picture of the page on for you. You can make a pressed flower place card. You can make a pressed flower bookmark. You can make pressed flower greeting cards. You can make pressed flower scrapbook. And uh, nowadays you can get very nice uh, paper for scrapbooks. Or you can buy the scrapbooks and it's all acid free. And it's just so much nicer than what we used to have to put up with. And so that is what I wanted to read to you because these are, this is just one, um, maybe I guess you would call it a pastime that women used to have and enjoy in it. People would look at it in later years, like in the 1960s, when people got more ed, uh, going to schools and colleges rather than being home and women went to work. They would look at something like this and wonder what the use was. You know, what was the use of this and and how can that, uh, you know, elevate you or make you a better person or educate you. But there's more to it than you realize when you start doing something slow like that how it balances your brain and how it increases your um, your thinking power. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to have more thinking power? And today, I'm very happy to tell you that I have 
uh, the Jane Austen's table book, and I was reading about picnics to you last time. So if you've got something to do, please go and get that started, and uh, maybe you could work while I talk. And also, if you're not sleeping well, it doesn't bother me that people use this to sleep by. At least it's good for something. And uh, I remember that when the web first came out, you know, over 20 years ago, someone had posted a wonderful article by someone who had written it. Uh, it was for a university project. And it was called Sleep We Have Lost. And it was all about how sleep uh, requirements and habits had changed since before the factories and the industries came out. And that people didn't always sleep a full, flat eight hours through without waking. In fact, it's been discovered that it might not be all that good for us to get eight hours of sleep straight in a row. Uh, I think it would be kind of hard on your kidneys <laughs> and hard on, uh, a, you know, if you're thirsty and get up in the night and have something to drink. I don't think anything's wrong with that. It's when we worry about it, when we become anxious about it about not being able to sleep is worse for you than not sleeping. And uh, this article uh, had an example of someone who had camped out on the hills above um, a place in Switzerland and noticed this little village uh, where everyone went to sleep real early, like after 6 o'clock in the evening or even before uh, that lights went out and Candles were snuffed out, and, and it was quiet. And then around, uh, I don't know, a few hours later, maybe uh, 8 o'clock or midnight, it came alive. And people uh, were up, and their pets were outside, and people could be seen through their windows reading, talking, having a cup of tea, eating. And then within an hour or so, uh, lights out again, and... Uh, and the village was quiet. And it just was an example in this article, Sleep We Have Lost, that showed that sleep habits were different. And they weren't always eight hours. And it was during the uh, time of the factories that someone invented the eight hours to sleep and eight hours to uh, for leisure and, and eight hours of work, uh, 24 hours. And uh, I'm not sure that's always been that good for people. And probably we can trace a lot of sleep problems uh, because of that belief that we have to sleep all the way through. So if you can't sleep um, anyway, you're welcome to listen to this and see if you can sleep at least an hour. <laughs> and so now I did discuss with you about the uh, picnics and enjoyed reading that to you. So I wanted to find something else uh, in here about it. And what I liked about this book is that it didn't just throw, show a bunch of recipes, which many books do, but it related them to the Jane Austen novels. Like it would have uh, some characters, Captain Frederick Wentworth's uh, ship's biscuits, and they would label it. She labels it after whoever, you know, Mrs. Reynolds' peach uh, pie, and and Pemberley chestnut soup, that sort of thing. So I want to read a little bit from, from the front of it here. And maybe I'll read to you about breakfast. Now, breakfast didn't always exist as we know it today, and... Uh, so there's a big history behind that one, too. Um, there are very... See, breakfast wasn't always... Uh, when you People thought that your body would just naturally break its fast, and so they didn't have to have a break fast uh, meal. But here's what this says, and it's from Jane Austen's, uh, Jane Austen's Table by Robert Chusley Anderson. And I'm really, really enjoying this book. And I'm enjoying, you can find uh, reviews on it on uh, YouTube. So you can go there and just type in the name of it on their search and find out 
what other people think of this book. <gasps> General Tilney's Hot Chocolate. Should we read that one? <laughs> it's winter here still, and I'm finished with it. <laughs> I'm just not going to do any more winter stuff. I did have a lot of winter ideas for you last time, but uh, I'm just kind of tired of it, and I'm not as interested. In it. I think it's run its course with me, so I'm just going to go back to summer. <laughs> And I'll talk to you more about that later. So, there are very few breakfast scenes in Jane Austen's novels. Now, remember, Mr. Brian Kozlowski wrote in his book, The Jane Austen Diet, how they often, uh, the Regency people would often get up, well, in Jane Austen's time, get up before breakfast and be outside walking. And uh, they didn't just, you know, roll out of bed and head for the coffee or head for the table. They go outside and they uh, walk for 20 minutes or go somewhere for 20 minutes before breakfast. Now, apparently, half an hour before sunrise is this wonderful natural blue light that is so needed to reset uh, your body and mind. And I have been trying to catch it, but we are in fog season and nothing shows up. Uh, even the sunrise does not show up, so I haven't been able to experience it. But if you can, if you're in a place where you can experience it, it's half an hour before the sun rises, get out there and see. It, it actually is blue. The sky has actually got a blue hue to it before the sun rises. And apparently there's also a blue light just before sunset, either before or after. You can look that up. And you can also look up what time the sun rises in your area on the web it'll probably come right back right up with the time so so there weren't many breakfasts in any of her novels and that really interests me because i used to be quite fascinated with with breakfast back in the 1970s when the restaurants started serving breakfast before that you could only go maybe to dinner at a restaurant but they started serving breakfasts and i thought they were just wonderful um, so, it says, perhaps this is because of the novelist's sense of propriety. After all, breakfast was, and still is, the most intimate and private of meals, taken when a household was still um, in muff tie, so to speak, not quite ready to face the day, and for a round of visits and visitors this might entail. Yes, uh, sometimes breakfast... You know, we think of the Victorians and the Regency people as, you know, sitting around a big table, but that isn't always the case. Often they had their meals in their rooms. Remember Mrs., the new Mrs. Gibson, and she told Molly, I think I'll take uh, my, my um, tea, my refreshments, my meal in my room. And these little hints in these books come around, but they did have a... Uh, a place that they could eat in their rooms. We have to be really careful around here when we're out in the country, though. Make sure nothing is uh, nothing is left, nothing is dropped. You don't store food in your room or anything because we live out in um, in the near the fields, you know, and we want to be really careful not to attract unwanted visitors. But uh, yes, people had uh, they had meals in their room. There's nothing wrong with that. I know someone who doesn't like to go to breakfast and she needs all the rest she can. So she keeps a little, I don't know what you would call it, but it has an ice pack in it. And um, I know some people have these miniature refrigerators they can plug in, but she, she didn't want to do that. So she has something where she keeps, has an ice pack in it and she keeps some things in it, some fresh, th fresh things in it. Uh, so if sh she does wake up, she doesn't have to quite get up. She can have breakfast in her room. And then she doesn't have to bother anybody to bring her anything. And she keeps her, her automatic shut-off uh, water kettle there and her various uh, teas. And she, in, in this little case, she this little refrigerated case, she keeps uh, her whatever she puts in her tea. So for a while, uh, most ordinary men and women of the Georgian period, that would be King George, right? That's before the Regency period. Uh, breakfast was often a hearty affair featuring bread, meat, and ale. 
eaten early to get the working day off to a good start and a full stomach, for the gentry breakfast was typically much lighter and certainly more leisurely, taken as late as 10 or 11 o'clock. And I notice today people are discovering, especially these uh, herbalists and naturopath doctors are really recommending that people not eat anything till 11 and let their bodies have a rest. And uh, so they wanted to let their working day get off to a good start on a full stomach uh, for the gentry breakfast was typically much lighter and more leisurely taken as late as 10 or 11 o'clock. In the cottage at Chawton, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Some of you people in England need to correct me. Uh, because, you know, they have, they, as they say about Americans, they haven't spoken English in, in decades. Um, Hampshire, where Jane Austen wrote her last three novels, we know that the writer, her mother and her sister, ate little more than tea and toast for the meal, and that only after an hour or two of small chores, a short country walk, or even a round of letter writing, Jane Austen, for example, fitted in an hour's practice at the piano forte before she set about making the family's tea. You know, I found myself so much brighter. You know, I'm always waiting till I'm smarter or stronger or um, stronger or younger before I come here and talk to you because I never just feel like I'm, it's just right. What I really need is a whole staff around me to get me ready. But uh, I tried that the other day because I felt like when I first woke up, I really wanted to write a letter to one of my descendants. And I had it all figured out what I wanted to put in it. I was going to make a magazine, kind of a magazine for them, handwritten, just one of a kind, just for them. And it was on my mind, and I didn't want to get up and go to the kitchen and start making noise in there and, and uh, preparing food. So I did get up and sat at a little desk near my uh, sleeping area and started to write. And you know, I did so well and I didn't feel hungry, had my tea things there until I had finished that uh, around 11 or 12 before I actually got ready. But I decided not to worry about it. And there's where the problem is. Uh, when we're getting ready, we start worrying about it and start hurrying. When you look at it, it's a shame we rush our children. We say, get in the bathroom and get showered and get dressed and come back out here for breakfast really quick. And then we're going to hit the books. You know, that is really a shame because one of the subjects they should have is getting ready. And it should be leisurely and um, not in a hurry, of course. You know, keeping in mind, being polite to the other members of the family, keeping this, getting the sink clean afterwards, and uh, making sure the bathroom's pleasant for the next person that comes in. Ideally, I think, if I were building a house, everybody would have, every bedroom would have its own bathroom. It's just silly to have one bathroom. Um, so here we go. And that only an after, after an hour or two of small chores, a country walk, or even a round of letter writing, Jane Austen, for example, fitted in an hour's practice at the pianoforte before setting about on the family's tea. Nonetheless, in grander homes, breakfast could become much more elaborate. At the pinnacle of the social hierarchy, the Prince Regent's favorite breakfast consisted of uh, three beef steaks washed down with white wine uh, and there was such there was such a thing as compromise during a visit to a wealthy relative. Jane Austen's mother wrote a letter praising the elegance of the breakfast table which featured chocolate coffee and tea, plum cake, pound cake, hot rolls, cold rolls, bread and butter. It is such elegance that this is the watchword of the recipes in here. So she has put these recipes together and I imagine they weren't too keen on saying, you know, whether something was a carbohydrate or a, or a, a protein because there were probably a lot more protein in the carbohydrates in those days, probably very good hard red wheat. 
at, or, or barley or something else. So she has Henry Crawford's Lazy Breakfast Eggs. And it is something you can do in the slow cooker. This is interesting. And uh, this is Cassandra's, Cassandra Austin's Scrambled Eggs. And of course, this would be her sister, Cassandra. And then they have oatmeal. And, uh, you know, I grew up on oatmeal. It was just a, and it's full of this wonderful magnesium. So I never had any skin problems or anything like that eating it. But uh, they didn't know how to make it taste very good in those days. Um, so they have an oatmeal recipe with some delicious fruit in it. And they have breakfast brioches, and Mary Crawford's um, tarragon and mushroom brioche, Lady Susan's raspberry and mascarpone brioche. And so there are several recipes for this. And I'd like to read more to you uh, of this in another in another video. So I will continue here. Now I had told you all something wonderful about workbooks on um, how you could make yourself a workbook where you would have lists of things that you wanted to accomplish or maybe even work on uh, character improvement or pr improving yourself, improving your posture, improving your weight, improving your voice, improving your knowledge, just uh, little things that you could write down and fill out that day. You could make your own workbook that way. You just get some lined paper or maybe not and make your own. It's like a scrapbook and make your own and do it maybe for a week and see how that works out. That way you can make a real skinny book and not worry about filling the whole thing out. If you've had enough and it, or it didn't work out for you, you don't have to end up with a half a blank book. But, you know, I one of my favorite uh, winter movies is uh, by this from a an author who wrote a series of books um, she was Canadian uh, about pioneer women and she wrote one called love comes softly and uh, so I had uh, read the book and she was a she wrote in a with Christian attributes and she often showed the difference between a character that had no knowledge of um, good behavior or was just deliberately ignoring it and other people and what the consequences were um, in their in their lives and in their relationships. But this was made into a movie and it's one of my favorite for winter and I like to watch it once a year. It's called Love Comes Softly. It's kind of like everybody likes to watch uh, It's a Wonderful Life uh, with James Stewart. And, but this is one that I like, and it's just such a sweet uh, story. It, it has its, its uh, tragedy, that's for sure. It's not for little children uh, because there's a death um, on the trail. They, you know, they traveled in these uh, covered wagons, and, and there was tragedy. But they made, when, the, when I got the DVD, they had enclosed this little booklet and it turns out to be kind of a study book or a workbook so if you order some of these um, I'm trying to think what the company is and it's called a discussion guide so if you've got somebody in your family a, a young person and you want to watch these and I've told you don't just set your children in front of a movie even your teenagers and just say watch this you're going to have to tell them what to watch for in these movies and uh because they'll say, uh, oh, yeah, I saw that movie. That does not mean they, they understood it or they took it to heart or they collected the character qualities from it that, that was intended. So here, what they've done is they thoughtfully published this little booklet that came with the DVDs. And, and they, they suggest that you learn a scripture, scripture reference, Psalms 30, verse 5. Romans 8, 35 to 39, Hebrews 6, 19. And uh, talking about grief, because there was grief in here. But here is some of the here are some of the discussion ideas, and it's like a workbook. And what you can do is you can make a workbook out of anything. You just put some blank pages in here and fill out your uh, observations of the story or the discussion. You don't have to have anybody here to discuss it with, but you can. 
write it down. It says, in an effort to help you reinforce the themes and message of Love Comes Softly, we have chosen clips from the film that you can show in your group. Now, you don't have to have a group to do this. But these clips can be downloaded online at www.foxfaith.com or shown through a specially made DVD that you can request at the same website. That's interesting, isn't it? I've never done that. These clips are followed up with questions and scriptures. These questions should draw your group members into a conversation about what they have just seen. Now, that would just be a wonderful subject uh, to have in your homeschool or if you want to just homeschool yourself. And I think if you think you're going to be a, a, a homeschooler, you need to homeschool yourself, really, and give yourself some, um, some books and some workbooks and some assignments uh, because it, it really will develop you as a teacher. So it says, it is not necessary to tackle these topics in a row or all in one night. If you would prefer to just cover one or two, feel free. It's all up to you. Now, I wouldn't need uh, to go there and, and look all that up, but I would find it interesting to see what how they approached it. But I what I do is I pause the movie and I talk about what just happened and what the attitude of, of the character was. And one of the reasons we had movies when our children were growing up is we were so isolated. We lived out on a ranch and we were homeschooling and rarely had, we didn't have much interaction with, with other people except at church. And, uh, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't constant. And I wanted the children to see, uh, how people spoke to one another or shouldn't have spoken to one another or should speak to one another. And uh, this movie seemed to portray quite a bit of that. Um, so, but I still might go and, and look that up. But this is a very uh, high quality pages here in this thing. And I've often thought this would be such a nice, uh, such a nice workbook. And they have a scripture reference, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. And they explain the meaning of the word love. And here's what they say. There are many different ways people use the word love. I love those shoes. I love that car. I love that movie. I love you. The same words can be used to describe a lot of different things. But when it comes to love between people, it basically assumes three different meanings. And it says a lot of acquaintance type relationships are based on this kind of love. And the, uh, so that's the first meaning that they, they put in there is wholly conditional. <laughs> and then the other one is uh, because and it is task oriented and that it's kind of complicated if the child is young and then they talk about the third type of love that's the perfect love that God speaks about and um, it's really important because as you go through the film you'll see this little girl that learns to love this woman that uh, can teach her so much and uh, because her father was a, a widower and you see a, a kind of a love blossoming there and an admiration for this new mother. And so Sarah Graham, who was a friend of hers in this movie, talks about a type of love that she has for her husband. And then there's the parenting type of love that it talks about. So there was a lot of good things that they pulled out of this story and uh, really do admire the woman that wrote it and she is living i believe she's still living and she uh is a consultant for you know directing some of these movies that were made out of her books and so i'll read to you about prayer and faith that they have in here Once Marty realizes the depth of Clark's devotion to God, she becomes more somber. Uh, Clark states that God always answers his prayers. Um, Clark tells Marty that in all the moments of his life, God has been right there beside him. Clark compares his relationship with God to that of himself and his daughter, Missy. And... Uh, it just it elaborates a little bit more on, on this.
Clark says after his barn burns down, that things are going to be fine, and he'll just keep praying for answers. Clark seems amazingly resolved as he stands among the ruins of his barn. He isn't daunted by the huge task of rebuilding. And uh, it's interesting how it uh, portrays hope. And I know that in our life at home, ladies, even in your homemaking and, and the things that you have to do and the difficulties you have, that some people today are very um, cynical and sardonic and they'll say you, you just have false hope. Uh, but if you have a, a huge job to do and you sent a picture to someone, wouldn't they say, uh, send me an after picture? I want to see how you do this. Uh, but today, there will be those who will say, oh, you don't have any hope. There's no hope of ever cleaning that up. And that shows someone who's very, very short-sighted. Uh, and so I hope that you're not that way with your things in your home. I wanted to uh, continue. I've got a few minutes left. And... Uh, I had Brian Kozlowski's book here that I just really like this book. I haven't read anything else he's written. I got stuck in this one and, and I just couldn't give it up. But I wanted to read, read again what he says about the Austin world and stress. And I'm speaking of the Jane Austen uh, books that were uh, written back in, the, in her day, which was called the Regency period, which was after King George, was it third? The one that lost the colonies, you know. And so he does uh, does address this idea of distress and what people did with distress. And if you want to see it in action, they did a very good job of interpreting what was in the books. When in Pride and Prejudice, Mrs. Um, Bennett became upset because her daughter had run off and married somebody in the military. And... Um, and she says, oh, my heart, and flutterings here and there. And her brother said, sister, don't think such gloomy thoughts. <laughs> and so after explaining how they handled stress, he says, we now know that, that stress, and I like to say distress, should only be a quick, short-term sensation. Unfortunately today, because we don't have any... Um, buffers that we create in our routines at the beginning of the day and we don't uh, build ourselves up enough, uh, our stresses, our distresses not, are not short-term sensations. We will try uh, to not think so much about it, but it just keeps coming back and replaying in our minds and there's something terribly wrong there. Uh, many animals benefit from the involuntary stress reaction. Its primary purpose has been to keep us and our ancestors alive during life-threatening situations, so some of it is beneficial. But he said, um, no str when stress, however, is allowed to linger, when we replay those life battles in our brains or worry about other battles in the future, our normal body functions are given the chronic cold shoulder. Crucial biological processes like healing, cell growth, proper digestion, metabolism, and weight management are all part put on minimal priority mode when, when distress is activated. Austin herself was very wary of this sort of long-term stress. Her healthiest characters are always trying to limit the time frame of their stress response to be only vexed for a moment not for days or weeks. A stressful thought might be involuntary, says Eleanor, but I will not encourage it. You can't nurture it. You can't add to it. You can't, you know, add salt and stir. And uh, left in a romantic limbo by Mr. Bingley in Pride and Prejudice, Jane Bennett has every right to be chronically stressed, too, but for her good sense soon prevails, helping her check the indulgence of those regrets which must have been injurious to her own health. So I really think that uh, reading about these people, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. And we always think it's just the end of our lives or the end of the world when something happens to us or to others that we love. Um, but uh, our response to it is either going to be uh, according to uh, our character and in our home life and our habits that we have at home. And that's why I think it's so important to develop 
good habits at home. Now, I also wanted to read a little bit of Linda Lichter's book here. And she wrote uh, Simple Social Graces. It was changed to the Benevolence of Manners in the second printing of it. But I want to read something about the home and what they thought of a home. Remember, she was the author that went through all the things she could find about the Victorian era, which was about, what was it, 1837 to 1907, something like that. It was during the time of Queen Victoria's life. And so she had to collect uh, their letters, diaries, um, paintings, um, pastimes, games, puzzles, uh, clothing, customs, uh, even from their weddings to their funerals to their education to their shopping, all these things she investigated all. She wrote a book on it all, and and it was mainly about women in the home, and you know what what it was like for them. So I want to read a chapter or read a paragraph for you here, called the the home is the sum of its parts. For the Victorians, impressing visitors with time-consuming decorating projects would hardly have been considered the point. The singularly resonant power of the Victorian home and one's membership in it, whether as breadwinner or breadmaker, endowed the smallest act uh, with shared value and respect. In other words, I've heard this said too, yes, my wife bakes, makes the bread and I make the living, and they, they're equal, equal in importance, because in those days, you know, if you wanted to buy bad bread, you could get it commercially. Uh, and today, it just seems like anything you could get for the home, get in the home, uh, you can get commercially. So everybody just kind of ignores the importance of the homemade thing, the homemade bread. It says, the everyday tasks that made up the bulk of women's work were valued because they were performed out of love for the family. And see, that's the main thing. And no matter what people say about you being home and the pressures that come with that, with people uh, pressuring you to go out in the world and, and earn a living instead of staying home and making a living, uh, making a life, uh, in spite of that, uh, the home and the things that you do for the home have great value uh, for your health, for, for the people, the members of the home, and for their health. And uh, they're performed out of your care and concern for the family. The, you do them because, uh, and, and you know, you do it without any thought, I'm sure, of being paid. And a lot of times, uh, when there's something that I need to do that's... Uh, not very much fun, you know, it's not my sewing, and it's not reading a book, and it's not uh, enjoying going for a walk, it's some other hard labor, and I'll say, I'll get paid for this stuff, but really you do, you get paid because you have peace of mind, and you might even be able to sleep better because of it, you don't have the noise coming in from uh, a place of work, you get to choose the atmosphere that you have. And I, before I go, I want to, to read a couple more things or tell you a couple more things. And that is that have things like, like I suggested, make yourself a workbook and have things that you have listed that you would like to improve. If Even if you never improve, even if it takes you 20 years to uh, get into shape and lose that weight, just keep doing it because it's something on your list that creates a routine for you to do that's very good for your uh, feeling of well-being. And I wanted to tell you about a lady that uh, she was on a holiday in uh, one of the northern states and they were staying in a, a motel and it was uh, out on a ranch somewhere in that area, you know, and there was a sudden snowstorm that they didn't expect and they could not get out. They couldn't leave when their time was up. And they, they were snowed in to that. They had to stay uh, three extra weeks, I guess, in this motel. And so this is where this woman was so smart. Her resourcefulness kicked in. She learned how to pass the days um, making things out of empty containers, making things out of um, the paper towel roll, the 
little cardboard tube. They went in there and doing things for her children. And she even managed to keep a scrapbook, uh, which she called Snowed In. This is where your resourcefulness um, goes to work. And uh, this is why it's so important to be resourceful, to think of things. We like to play a game ca called What If. You know, what if you didn't have this? Or what if you didn't have this? What could you use? And I'm uh, thinking that there might have been a movie or something that I watched years and years ago where someone was put to this test and uh, he, he would always answer what it was that he would do. And so this resourcefulness is, you know, think snowstorm or think heat wave or something like that, somewhere where you're stuck and think of what you would do. No books to read? Write some stories. Um, no, no movies to watch? Put on some plays, you know, if you've got anybody to do that with. Otherwise, just uh, write them out yourself. Um, no, no sewing or crafts to do. You can figure out a way to do things and to put things together. And this is why resourcefulness is so important for the home because you are going to have those times. And you know, the scriptures say that we are to work with our hands and mind our own business. And those of you that are caught up in uh, what the media is telling you that this government or that government is do, government's doing and the wars and rumors of wars, remember, that may not be your business. Your business is your house. Is your house in the order that you want it? Are you improving in the way that you want to? Are you, uh, what is your happiness level? And how can you work on that? Of course, people will say, well, if this thing gets cleared up with this war, then I'll be happy. But you see, they'll invent another war after that. They'll keep you in a constant state of uh, defeat. And uh, so, but that, that really is not your business of the home. And you know, Titus 2 says uh, that the women should guard and guide the home. That is so important. And so when you think of all the things you'd really like it to be like, wouldn't you like to make a little corner for uh, for your children where they can go and read or be quiet? You know, instead of putting them in the corner, make a pleasant little corner that which they are rewarded with and they can go sit there. Um, there are so many things that you can do in the home. You can make a library area. You can make a music room. You can make uh, a dining room. You can, uh, and you can play like so many ways and so many things. And even if you're vital like me, you can still do it and, uh, and, and keep your mind really active. And so ladies, my time has run out because I don't like to be here more than an hour. And please remember, you don't have to listen to the whole hour. You can pause it and start again later on. And uh, remember, these are just ideas that I have based on my own observations and some of my experiences and listening to other people. And uh, so you don't have to take it uh, completely to heart. Do what is best for you, what works best in your home. And so until I see you again, stay close to Christ. Goodbye.